Good morning, everyone. It's time to begin our service. Let's all stand up. Second Sunday of December, so we're getting closer to Christmas Day. I was thinking uh, 1 John chapter 4 lets us know what the, the season is all about. In verse 9 it says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. I didn't read that very well, but I just, the season that we're in is Christmas, and you know, we, we give it a lot of emphasis for a lot of different things, but, but Christmas is really the celebration of God's great heart for each one of us. And we celebrate the season because God sent his only begotten son into this earth to, to die for us. And Jesus did that. And that just shows God's great love for us. Amen. Aren't you excited about that this morning? Amen. So let's just celebrate the love of God. Just be reminded of all the things that God has done for us, especially sending the gift of Jesus. So Father, we just come to you this morning and we just thank you that you are here in this place. We thank you, God, that we are here because of you and because of what we celebrate this season, and that is you loving us in our sinful state, and you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to come and die for us. God, that is, a, that is the greatest demonstration of love, and we celebrate your love this morning. I pray, God, that as we worship you, Lord, that we will just get an even greater revelation of your great love for each one of us. God. So we just open up our hearts to receive from you today, but above all, we want to worship you and give to you this morning of our worship and our thanks for what you've done for us. So God, we just, we're going to worship you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And as we do that, I just believe that you're going to move and accomplish what you want to in our midst today. And if you're in agreement, we all say, Amen.
thankful for the love of God this morning.
robe incarnate wrapped in flesh heaven bent to dwell with us oh what a mystery oh what a mystery the sacred gift to break the curse the father's heart revealed to us Oh, what a joyous thing, oh, what a joyous thing. Oh, come let us adore Him, oh, come let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. For He alone is worthy, for He alone is worthy. Behold the Lamb of Righteousness, let every heart and tongue confess, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, remaining no accusing voice, His resurrection power triumphant in Jesus' name, triumphant in Jesus' name. Oh, God, let us adore Him. Oh, God, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. For He alone is worthy. For He alone
before you, Lord. We worship you, God, with everything that's in us, God. We give you all the Let's give it worship. Come on.
think I could sit for like an hour and just let them play that one frame. That just ushers me into what I feel like heaven's going to be. I don't know. I know it doesn't do the same for all of you. That's okay. We all have our songs. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, this morning we have good news and blessed news. We want to send our congratulations to Andrea and Brett Snyder on a healthy, happy, beautiful baby boy, James Levi. And he's just a gorgeous little guy. And his hair looks dark to me, but he might have some reddish color going on there. I'm not sure. But um, they had a beautiful baby this week on Wednesday. And um, nothing better for this season, right, than to have a beautiful new baby boy. Hallelujah. Or girl. Hallelujah. So God is so good. Amen. Amen. So good. Thank you, Father. Let's receive our tithes and offerings right now. Matthew 6, 31 and 33. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Hallelujah. And our confession, today I choose to trust in God and his word. I say no to any worry that tries to creep into my mind, will, or emotions. I will not allow external pressures or circumstances to rob me from the joy of giving. God is in complete control, and he is totally able to take care of my needs. Today, I choose to trust God completely with my finances. Father God, we stand firm on your word, and we thank you that you have done exceedingly abundantly above what we pray or believe during these times. And Father, if nothing else, the last two years, you have proven your word to us. You have blessed us with jobs and better jobs and raises and bonuses. You have kept us working. You have been so awesome during this time of lack and need and, and fear amongst the world. Lord, we keep our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith. And we give you glory and we give you honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen. These lights are extremely bright. Is it just me? I feel like I'm looking into the sun out in the foyer again. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, gee, I've done my part. Last week, I think I forgot to take the offering. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Mike. I do want us to pray. Uh, Dave's friend, some of you might remember Big Mike that came here years ago. He passed away this week, 37 years old. And uh, God had done some good things in his life. He'd found a nice church. He'd moved back home, right? Mm -hmm. And um, where was his home? In Connecticut. Connecticut. Yeah, yeah and um, just, you know, he found a nice church, and he was engaged, and God was doing some good things, and evidently it was some challenge with COVID. And uh, so that's another sad, sad loss. But, Lord, we just thank you for watching over uh, his family. Lord, we know he's in a better place today, but we also know he was too young. Yeah. And so, Father, we just ask for comfort and peace and strength right now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So many sad stories over these last two years. So just, again, my admonition to all of us and my encouragement is enjoy life. Get out and enjoy life. Be wise, but enjoy your life. Amen? Amen? Last night we went, and Isley's given us some culture in our family. She was in the Nutcracker. And we actually went to a theater. And all these years, I kind of grew up in Haverty Grace because we boated all the time. I didn't know there was a theater there. Right beside the fire station. Whew. 
who would have thunked it? But it was it was so nice watching her, and um, you know, just so so fun and enjoying the season, and doing a little bit of a piece of normal again. So I want to encourage you: enjoy this season, um, enjoy this time. Reach out to somebody, maybe the Holy Spirit. If you've been thinking about somebody from long ago. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit wanting you to connect or contact and just send them a card or pick up the phone and wish them season's greetings. And, um, you know, don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate. Be led by the Spirit of the living God. Amen. Pastor? Amen. So pray for those that were affected by the uh, tornadoes down in. So, you ready for the word this morning? Okay, the kids can go to junior church. Let's uh, open our Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 14 this morning. Get used to this new microphone here. We're going to be, um, we're going to continue with our theme. It just seems like God has just really been speaking to us about the area of breakthrough and a couple of weeks ago, I talked about that. I talked about two aspects of breakthrough, and that was uh, really I was talking about um, breaking through for others. And I was talking about intercession, standing in the gap, making up a wall. And then we were also talking about uh, breaking through strongholds, tearing down walls, and seeing people set free. And then last week, Pastor Debbie spoke about hope. And I believe that that is just a theme that just keeps stirring up in my spirit. And I know that God just wants to remind us of that. And uh, this morning, I want to talk about personal breakthrough. We talked about breaking through for other people, but I want to talk about personal breakthrough this morning. So, Father, I just thank you for your word. Thank you. I'm anointed to minister the word in boldness and clarity, and each of us are anointed to hear it and receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite people in the Bible is King David, and I, I love him because I believe that many of us can identify with David. You know, God called him a man after his own heart. And, and so David was a man that sought after God and his deepest desire was to please God in every area of his life. And I, I believe that most of us are like that way to a certain degree. And, you know, there's a fire in our hearts for God. Sometimes it's more ablaze than at other times. But we do love God and we want to serve him. And, and David was also a man who made mistakes. And, but when he did, he was really quick to repent and to get back on track, and I hope that we can identify with that as well. We're looking at David's life when he finally becomes king. You know, he, um, he was anointed king many years before he became king, and Saul was the king at the time, and, and, uh, but Saul is out of the way, and David is now the king. And there was a short period of time where he was the, the king over just Judah because uh, Saul had a son that was uh, still trying to assume the throne. And, but now the kingdom has been united, and, and, and it's underneath of David's reign. And, and one of the first things he does is to unite the kingdom. He, he chooses Jebus to be the capital uh, because it was... Uh, right on the border of Judah and Israel. And so he chooses uh, Jebus to be the capital and he changes the name of it to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem means city of peace or city of wholeness or foundation of peace. So he's king over a united kingdom and now he has a capital city. So everything seems to be going his way. Then his desire was to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, making worship the centerpiece of the nation. So even though David um, had rightly discerned God's heart concerning bringing the ark to Jerusalem, he made a mistake by not inquiring of God as to how to bring it back. Now, ha have you ever had the right intentions, but either your timing was off or you really didn't seek the Lord about how to do something before you did it? I, 
I hate when that happens. Because you, you can take something that's meant to be so good and then you mess it up. And it takes a long time to, to get things back to where they were so you could go forward with, with what God's plan was. Well, David tried to bring the ark back and he thought, well, you know, God's plan was very stated very clearly and that was that ark of the presence of God was to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. But David decided he would put it, he made this brand new cart for it, got a Cadillac cart, you know, and he, he puts the ark on the, on the cart and he starts bringing it back to Jerusalem and uh, the cart began to shake and Uzzah, one of the priests, reached out to steady the ark and, and when he touched the ark, he was struck dead. So instead of seeking the Lord, in this rare case, David makes a huge mistake and David decides just to forget about the whole thing and he moves the ark to the home of Obed-Edom. And because of his great disappointment, David seems to forget about the plans of God. He forgets about the ark and he settles into living for himself. So let's pick this up in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Now, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees with masons and carpenters to build him a house. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, for his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. Then David took more wives in Jerusalem, and David begot more sons and daughters. And these are the names of his children whom he had in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, El Pelet, Nogan, Nepheg, Japhiah, Elishima, Beeliada and Eliphalet. Now, those are some good biblical names. <laughs> Last week I suggested to Brett that they should name their son Shobab Eliphalet Snyder because it had a nice ring to it. <laughs> and uh, they went with James Levi. I mean, go figure. I, I just I don't understand that. So even though David was living life. And even though there was a sense of accomplishment and a sense that he was doing in the acceptable will of God, I get a real sense that there was a restlessness in his heart. Here he was, a man after God's own heart who wanted to please him. And though he was successful in so many things, his deepest desire had ended in failure. And it was such a godly desire. You know, we can, we can be that way. Or perhaps, maybe, we've heard from God and we did everything exactly the way that we believe God told us to do. And yet, we don't get the results that we were expecting and disappointment sets in. And disappointment has a way of robbing us of our spiritual passion. So, he did what many of us do. We turn to what we know we can be successful at. And for each of us, that's probably different. But for David, he built a house, and there's nothing wrong with building a house. Many of us in here have built houses. There's nothing wrong with that. I think building the house was a way for David to enjoy his success. Deuteronomy 6, though, warns us that as we begin to experience prosperity, that we are not to forget God who brought the prosperity into our lives. Amen. So David also married more wives. Now, not only was that disobedience to the law of God, but it was definitely a sign of his restlessness. I mean, I, I love my wife passionately, but dear Lord in heaven, one is enough. <laughs> All the men say? Amen. Okay. <laughs> David must have built a big house. David's son Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 25, he said, it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now, David's viewpoint was different than his son's because he put the wives up on the roof. <laughs> he didn't go there. He put them up there. 
And he had a bunch more children. Now, according to what is recorded at the end of chapter 13, it was three months' time between the, the first attempt to bring the ark to Jerusalem and the second successful attempt. So, obviously, we know that it takes nine months to have a child. So there wasn't any birthing that was going on during that time, but there was a whole lot of seed sowing that went on during that three months because he ended up with a lot of children. So because of disappointment, David gets busy with life and becomes entrenched with the busyness of life. And many of us do that. We basically turn our disappointment into self-focused busyness. David had so much going for him, but, but there was that one unfulfilled desire that had left a void in his heart. So he tried to fill a God void with a worldly remedy. But when we do that, the void never goes away. It's always there. And even though we try to fill it with other stuff, that void festers with disappointment and even anger toward God, and it eats at us. You know, if, we, if we dwell on disappointment too long, it turns to anger. And then that wall between us, that separation between us and God gets bigger. Verse 8. Now, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David, and David heard of it and went out against them. Then the Philistines went and made a raid on the valley of Rephaim. Now, this restlessness in our hearts opens the door of opportunity for the enemy to come against us. It's a good opportunity because the enemy knows that at the core of our restlessness is disappointment with God that results in, our, in a cooling of our relationship with him. In other words, we've been disappointed with God, so we filled our lives with other stuff, which has affected our spiritual fervor and vitality. That means that we are vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. In David's case, the enemy was the Philistines. The Philistines were a Canaanite nation that was the primary adversary of a lot of the judges of Israel. If you look through, if you read through the book of Judges, you'll find, you know, the Philistines were attacking uh, Israel a lot. And then through the reign of King Saul and King David, you see uh, these attacks of the Philistines. So they were going up to meet in the valley of Rephaim, and Rephaim actually means giant. So it was the Valley of Giants, and these giants were the descendants of the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis, which I'm not going to get into this morning. But although David had defeated Goliath, there were still giants that he was going to have to face in battle. There were still giants. Why do you think he took five stones? It wasn't that he thought he missed with four of them, and he just thought he'd get him with the fifth. It's because uh, Goliath had four brothers. And as you read through, you can see where those brothers were killed. And I mean, there are probably other giants in the land as well. Many of us have beaten giants in our past. You know, we've experienced a degree of victory and freedom. Yet, as we have progressed in our relationship with God, we realize that there are still giants in the land that we need to battle with before we can experience not just the fullness of God's presence, but to fully reach our destiny and fulfill our God given call that he's placed upon our life and enter into fruitfulness and these giants will constantly harass us like the philistines did and it's an adversary that not will not go away until we gain complete victory philistine interesting the word means the root word means to roll in dust or to wallow in self our primary battle is not some attack of the enemy against us. It's the constant battle we face against ourselves. There are giants in our land that are keeping us from our destiny. And a lot of times, the giants are us. The word wallow, I, I like the definitions of this word. First, it means to roll oneself about in a lazy, relaxed, or ungainly manner. Like hogs wallowing in the mud. It means to billow forth, to surge. It means to devote oneself entirely, especially to take unrestrained pleasure or delight. To become abundantly supplied, to luxuriate, a family that wallows in money. Must be nice. To indulge oneself immoderately, wallowing in self-pity. How many of us have done that before? 
to become or remain helpless, allow them to wallow in their ignorance. So a giant in our life would be something that we wallow in that is spiritually unproductive and something that harasses us and wraps us up or engulfs us. So the question, the first question is, what are the giants in your land? What is holding you back from fulfilling your destiny? I've had to ask myself that question in the past, and it can be a painful question to ask because you do, we really don't want to hear what the answer is. We think in terms sometimes that a giant is a blatant sin. You know, uh, perhaps you're dealing with sin in an area of your life, possibly habits that you can't break, maybe things you're involved in that you shouldn't be in. Some of you see your circumstances as a giant that is holding you back. It may be physical problems or generational curses. It could be stubbornness, an unforgiving spirit, an unteachable spirit. It could be a spirit of self-sufficiency. You know, I can deal with my own problems. I don't need anybody else to help me. It could be the knowledge of a problem, but not the willingness to deal with it. It could be that independence and wanting to control your own life, to make your own decisions apart from God. It could be low self-esteem to believe a belief of unworthiness. It could be fear or the I can't do it syndrome. It could be personality traits or personal makeup that holds you back. We could probably pick the giants out in somebody else's life, but this isn't about you picking on them. This is about you looking at yourself and me looking at myself, all right? What are the giants in your land? God wants us to impact our communities and take the land for him, but we first have to conquer ourselves. And in David's case, and more often than not, like us, that giant is really disappointment. It is disappointment that has been turned inward. Something has happened in the past that disappointed us or didn't happen when we thought it was supposed to. And so we just deal with disappointment and it becomes this wall that keeps us from moving forward. Look at verse 10. And David inquired of God saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, go up for I will deliver them into your hand. So I'm just going to declare just like for here, today is the day of victory for each one of us. Verse 11. So they went up to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, they called the name of that place Baal Perazim. This was probably an unnamed mountain, but when God brought the victory, David named it Baal Perazim. And Baal Perazim means master of breakthroughs. Breakthrough comes from God. I love Micah chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. The one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. Their king will pass before him with the Lord at their head. God is the leader. He is the master of breakthroughs, and he's the one that leads us into breakthrough and victory. Not just against the enemy, but victory over every area of ourself that we have wallowed in or indulged in over the years in our lives. Are you ready for that this morning? Verse 13. Then the Philistines once again made a raid on the valley, and therefore David inquired again of God, and God said to him, You shall not go up after them, circle around them, and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear a sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, that you shall go out to battle, for God has gone out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. So David did as God commanded, and they drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Gezer. Then the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. We have to understand, first of all, the enemy does not give up easy. He is a harasser. Those elements of self will always be there, and they're going to try to raise their ugly heads up. But we have to have the determination to follow through to complete victory. 
When Israel moved into the promised land under Joshua, they failed to completely drive out the Canaanites from the land, and those people in there became a constant harassment to them. They settled for a degree of victory, but not the full thing. So listen, the greatest opponent of excellence is good. And the greatest opponent of a total victory is settling for a partial victory. You know, sometimes we've been fighting something so long and then we get a little bit of a victory and it's like, okay, we've arrived and we've just started really. But if we settle for that, we'll never fully break through into all that God has for us. Victory and breakthrough belong to us. God is greater than the giants that are in our land. And here's the great thing. After driving out the giants in chapter 15 and 16, David begins to seek the Lord in earnest again, and his dream is fulfilled. The ark comes back to Jerusalem, and he brings it back the way the Lord said to bring it back. Worship and the presence of God are in the midst of Jerusalem all of the time. is going on 24 hours a day. So David completely moves from disappointment to breakthrough. Then in chapter 17, David desires to build the temple, to build a house for God. And this time, instead of building it, he asks God about it. He does what we're supposed to do, ask God about it. And when he asked God, the Lord told him, said, look, David, I don't want you to do that. That's going to be your son that's going to raise up and build that temple. I don't want you to do that. But because you wanted to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house. And what he was talking about there was David's name and his legacy and his, you know, his inheritance. God was going to work on it. When we fully pursue God and inquire of him, not only will we find fulfillment, but God will keep us from overstepping our calls so that we do not undertake things he has not purposed us to do. There's fulfillment and joy in being obedient to the yeses and the noes of God. And it's very important that we spend time in the presence of God that we can discern between the two. Chapter 18, verse 1. And this... After this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines, subdued them, and took Gath and its towns from the land, hand of the Philistines. So David subdues the Philistines, and although they were not annihilated, never again did the Philistines pose a hindrance to David. David still made some mistakes, but he was quick to repent. Now, God wants to bring breakthrough into our lives this morning. And he wants to birth forth and he wants to start something new in us and he wants to start in us so that he can then start around us as well. So the question is, are you willing to conquer yourself? Are you ready for breakthrough? Are you ready to allow God to heal your disappointed heart? To finish, I I, I want to go to this. The Lord just brought this up in my spirit, but I want to go to a New Testament account of the disciples And we find this in John chapter 21. This account takes place after the crucifixion and the resurrection. Beginning in verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. First, let me say that the Sea of Tiberias is the same sea as the Sea of Galilee. All right, it's just two different names for the same sea. And the Sea of Galilee was the sea that the disciples previously made their living as fishermen. All right, this is very important. But it wasn't always prosperous. The disciples first encountered Jesus after an unsuccessful fishing trip. In Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 4, it says, When he, meaning Jesus, had stopped speaking, He said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Now, have you ever been on a, went fishing and you had high hopes for a great catch and you ended up catching very little? Anybody ever done that? 
I've, I've, I've learned that there's a difference between fishing and catching, all right? A few months ago, I was invited on a fishing trip, and the leaders of our region of MFI is a couple of younger pastors, and they wanted to honor four of us who they called the fathers of the faith. And so they had arranged this fishing trip, and they invited uh, me and Pastor Steve and Pastor Buddy and Pastor Victor to go with them. And so they picked me up at the hotel early in the morning, and then we drove, we met the other pastors, and we drove three hours to Smith Mountain Lake for a fishing trip. And so um, we got into the boat, and the captain was a very nice guy, and he was really excited because the fish had really been biting. And so he took us to where the fish had been biting the most. And I mean, we looked on the whatever he had there, and you could see fish down there. And so he, uh, he told us to begin fishing. And I liked this fishing trip because he supplied all the gear. He baited the hooks. And then if you caught a fish, he took the fish off. That was really, and then he rebaited your hook. It was really nice. So we start fishing. I throw my line over, and uh, soon I, I caught a, a perch. Pulled it up, and yeah, it's a decent sized perch. Um, <laughs> decent sized perch. And uh, Pastor Steve caught a huge catfish. And another pastor caught, I think it was a perch. I, they all look alike to me, but the captain said it was a perch, so I'll take his word for it. So we caught three fish, and then Buddy kept saying he was going to get the biggest fish, and, and uh, something nibbled at his line, and he, he lost it, but he said it was big. I don't know. Um, but then we started going around the lake uh, to find these other, and we couldn't find any more fish. Now, from a standpoint of fishing, it was really disappointing. I mean, I had plans. I was trying to figure out how I was going to get all these fish home, you know, because we were staying in Richmond, and so I, we'd have to get them three hours to Richmond, and then we're going to spend the night there, and then I got to get them all the way home. I was going to cook them on the grill and really uh, impress Debbie with my self-sufficiency. <laughs> and um, so I gave my fish to the pastor that was set up the trip for us. And, and so we, um, we ended up praying for the captain. He was a really nice guy. He was, I don't believe he was a Christian because um, while we were fishing, he made a comment that he was hoping, you know, normally men would laugh at this comment that he made and none of us laughed. And so he realized, you know, found out we were pastors and, <laughs> and he's like, man, I'm on a boat full of pastors. What is this? So we prayed for him, and it was just really neat because, uh, you know, God just spoke through us to him as we prayed for him, and he, was, he got finished. He said, man, I feel the Holy Ghost all over me. And it's like, he don't even know the Holy Ghost, you know, but he, he felt something. That was good. But from a fishing standpoint, it was disappointing because we really didn't catch much. Now, personally, it was, it was a lot of fun because I was hanging out with pastor friends, and I desperately needed that, you know, just the fellowship, the good time with them, and the lake was beautiful and the, the mountains around it, was, it was just gorgeous. You know, but from a fishing standpoint, it was disappointing. But for the disciples, we need to understand that this was not a recreational fishing trip for them. This was their living. I mean, food on the table, literally, food on the table for them was catching fish that they could sell and make their money. And so when they fished all night long, it would be like working all night long and getting absolutely nothing done. And then not getting paid for it. Keep that in mind. So it was a disappointment for them. So from a fishing standpoint, the Sea of Galilee was a disappointment for them many times. I'm sure that wasn't the only time they fished all night long and caught nothing. And then there were two storms on the lake, that, as you recall. The first one, Jesus was with them. He's sleeping in the bottom of the boat, and the storm came up. And I'm sure the disciples had seen storms before, but this was something that they were afraid of. They were trying to get from one place to the other, and the storm comes up, and they wake Jesus up and say, Jesus, aren't you afraid? Are you going to watch us perish? And Jesus just got up and calmed the storm, and they went on to where they were going. 
There was another storm. Jesus wasn't with them this time in the boat. He was actually up on the mountain praying and he saw them down there. And they were on the boat and the storm rose up. So he just walks on the water to get to them. And Peter, you know, said, Jesus, if that's you, call me. And Jesus called him. He steps and he walks on the boat. I don't know how far he walked, but he walked on the boat, uh, on the water for a while. And then he took his eyes off of Jesus, began to sing. Jesus uh, grabbed his arm and then put him in the boat, calmed the storm, and they went. So this lake was a lake of disappointments. It was a lake of storms. It was a lake of fear. And then there were times when I'm sure they were successful. So they get to here in John 21, and they're thinking, well, maybe this trip is going to be a little bit different, this fishing trip. In verse 2, it says, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. So they have another disappointing fishing trip. We also have to understand that these disciples have been following Jesus for three and a half years. And they had listened to what Jesus was teaching them and Jesus had told them about the kingdom. And so I am sure that there was all these kind of hopes that these disciples had. You remember one place where uh, the mother of, uh, of um, uh, James and John asked Jesus, can one of my sons sit on your right and one on the left when you're in your kingdom? They had this view of some kind of kingship that Jesus was going to have, that they were going to be a part of, that they were going to be lifted out of that fishing life and, and brought into a place of prominence. Three and a half years, they've been looking forward to this, and then all of a sudden, they see Jesus crucified on the cross. You're talking about disappointing? All those things you heard Jesus say for three and a half years, and now you're seeing him hanging on a cross? All the hopes that they had, the dreams that they had, just crashed. Yeah, they saw Jesus resurrect, but Jesus wasn't talking about an earthly kingdom anymore. He was talking about leaving them. And I'm sure the disciples were like, okay, he was dead, now he's alive. But... It's just not the same. All of these hopes that we had, all of these things that we thought we were going to accomplish, it's all gone. So I'm sure the disciples were dealing with disappointment with Jesus because things didn't turn out the way they thought Jesus was telling them that they would. So here in John 21, the disciples go fishing again. They thought if they can't be successful building a kingdom, they'll go back to what they were successful at. Just like David forgot about bringing the ark to the kingdom, he went back to what he was good at. The disciples thought, we'll go back and do what we're good at. However, the results of the fishing trip were extremely disappointing because it was another all-night fishless fishing trip. Verse 4, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered, no. I don't know. Sometimes I think Jesus plays with us. He asks us obvious questions. He knows the answers to. He knows the disciples are out there all night long. Hey, you got any fish? No. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in, in the little boat for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish then as soon as they come, had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. You know, they went from catching nothing to catching 153 fish. 
Now, I, I, I knew that there had to be significance to the number 153 because if you remember in Luke, what we read earlier, it just said a large catch of fish. But here there's specific, 153 fish. So I, I began to study this. I did some research, study, study of biblical numerology and word studies and commentaries. And after the, all of that, I discovered that 153 fish means actually 153 fish. <laughs> And the 154th got away, and it was bigger than any of the other ones. So they go from disappointment to breakthrough. And Jesus taught them on the shore there that day what the kingdom was all about. He recommissioned Peter. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than this? Do we love God more than the things that we're good at? Do we love God more than the things that's easy for us to fall back to? Do we love God more than the giants that are in our life? And Peter was convicted and he says, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you. Three times he said that. And Jesus commissioned him. And then I believe that there was all of a sudden there was just this beginning of an understanding. Oh, this is what the kingdom is all about. I shared all that to prophesy this over us this morning. Do not give in to disappointment when you don't see the results that you expected to see. Do not give up on God's word to you. Do not give up on your vision. Do not give up on the dream of a great catch or great results. Don't give up on the fact that God has called you and God wants to use you. He wants you to experience his fullness. He wants you to transform your world. He wants you to impact the people that are around you. And here's what I want you to hear. The same sea where you came up empty before, the same sea where you faced your greatest fears like the winds and the waves, that same sea is the same place where your greatest treasure will come from. Conquer the giants that would try to stop you and deal with the disappointment in your life. Don't allow the draw of the busyness of living keep you from fulfilling your call and keep you from fulfilling God's call upon your life. God is in the process, I believe, of turning disappointment into breakthrough for me, for you, for this church, for your family. You know, and I know God is wanting to get this through to us because if you remember at First Friday, Melissa prayed about disappointment. Debbie shared hope last week. God's the God of hope. Another area of, of disappointment can just be the constant harassing of the enemy that affects momentum. Maybe in your life. You know, you, 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 and I've seen it in the church. There are times when it looks like we're, we're, we're finally picking up momentum and then something happens and then you feel like you're back to square one. It can be that way in your life. You know, you, you make decisions and all of a sudden it looks good and then something happens and it's like, whoa. And so you feel like you're just spinning your wheels, getting momentum and then sliding back, getting momentum and sliding back. And disappointment can really affect you in that area. The enemy will keep harassing us over and over and over until he realizes that we will not give up. When we give up, you've lost the war and now you're serving the giant. Come on. But when you keep fighting, I don't care how many times it looks like you're about ready to beat it and then you slip back and then you start again. Until that giant is defeated, you have to keep going over and over and over and over. You cannot give up. God is ready to turn disappointment into total breakthrough. So I'm just encouraging you this morning, re-engage your heart to God's purposes. Let God heal your disappointed heart. Seek the Lord like never before. 
and watch God turn your disappointments into breakthroughs. Amen. Can you receive that this morning? Amen. There, there's one scripture that has meant so much to me in the last, since 2000, the end of 2014, and it's Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the God of hope. The God of hope. And for us to experience that hope, it says, may he fill you with joy and peace in what? Believing. You cannot stop believing. You've got to hold on. Hope is confident expectation. So that means that there is a confident expectation that what you are striving for, what you're believing for, what you're moving toward is finally going to manifest in your life. So it takes believing. It's not just a, 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 a you know, thinking about it. Okay, I, 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 yeah, it's going to happen. And then something happens. Okay, it must not have been God. It means believing. It means being firm. You have a confident expectation that God is going to come through for you and what he has spoken to you. And when we have that confident expectation, hope does not disappoint. And what that means is hope does not disappoint us from what we are believing for. It doesn't cause us to fall away, lose heart. It doesn't cause us to give up on what God has appointed us to. So we have to hold on to hope. Hope has got to be the foundation of our relationship with God. The confident expectation that God is going to honor his word, he's going to honor his promises, and he's going to come through for you. Regardless of what you see. Regardless of how many times you got close and then it didn't happen. He's the God of hope. It's going to happen. Stand with me, please. I'm just going to pray a prayer over us. I just feel this so strong in my spirit that I believe that probably all of us in here are dealing with disappointment to some degree. Maybe it's just a little bit. Maybe there's something else. Maybe it's larger. So I'm just going to pray and believe and just declare some things over all of us this morning. Can we receive that? Amen. So Father, I thank you that you are a God that does not disappoint. Lord, I, first I ask you to forgive us for every time that we've outstepped your plan for our life. Forgive us for every time that we've allowed disappointment to disappoint us that we've allowed disappointment to, to, to make us turn our focus off of you and place it on other things to find our fulfillment. Because only true fulfillment only comes from you, God. So forgive us for that. But Lord, I just pray right now that you will just stir up in each one of us that you will stir up a passion for you and for following all that you have for us, God, that no matter how much the enemy harasses us, no matter how much he comes against us, no matter how much he tries to, to pull the hope out of our heart, God, we will not allow hope to leave us in the name of Jesus, but we will hold on to hope with every fiber of our being. God, we will see that the promises that you have given us, and we'll be reminded of those, God, and we will re-engage with your plans for our life and not just get busy with just life and living. But we will re-engage with you, Lord Jesus. So I pray over every person in here this morning, Lord, especially those that are dealing with disappointment to any level. God, I just thank you that you are the God that heals the hurting heart. You are the God that, that ministers to those voids in our life, Lord. You are the God that helps us to lift ourselves up off of the, of the carpet when we've just been hit so many times. And you're the one that helps us to lift up our eyes and see you as the God of hope, the God who never fails to fulfill his promises. And so I just pray, God, that you will help each one of us to re-engage our hearts with your plans for our life. 
that we will re-engage our hearts with your plans for our families. That you will help us to re-engage our heart for your plans for our church. For everything that we're involved in, Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you are turning disappointment to breakthrough. You are the master of breakthroughs. And God, I just thank you for breakthrough in every area of our life. In the name of Jesus. I declare that in the name of Jesus. And if you can receive that, we all say, Amen. 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 So Father, we just, I pray a blessing over each one here this morning and those that couldn't make it today. Pray for all those that are watching. God, I just thank you that you are the God of hope. And I pray, God, if they don't know you as Lord and Savior, that they will just reach out to you. God, that we'll just grab a hold of you and, and just experience that great love that we talked about at the very beginning of the service, that love that sent Jesus to die for us. And that we'll experience that love and they will as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.